Hi, I'm Martin Fowler. I call myself a uh, author, speaker, and general loudmouth on software development. I've originally started out as uh, a consultant, worked for a couple of companies first, and then was independent for quite a few years. And during that time, I started exploring writings and various articles for magazines. Um, but it was a long time ago. They had magazines in those days. And then after that, um, I began working on my first books. I wrote uh, analysis patterns a long time ago, um, and then very rapidly wrote UML Distilled, uh, which was my first real big seller. Um, I followed up with that with refactoring, patterns of enterprise application architecture. I wrote uh, planning extreme programming, um, joint with Kent Beck. Um, and uh, Domain Specific Languages was the, the last solo book I did before uh, the NoSQL that still I'm going to talk about now. As well as writing books, um, the other thing that I'm very much focused on is my website. So I have a website, martinfowler.com, and I try to put all sorts of interesting articles, blog posts, all sorts of things on there, and try and really keep that up and going. And that's uh, a large part of my writing target at the moment. Hello, my name is Pramod Sadalge. I am a computer science graduate from Walton College of Engineering in India. And I got interested in the whole aspect of databases and what they do for you, uh, especially when I was trying to work with a company that was trying to write like this uh, transparent gateway to any database. So you could develop in database A and deploy in database B. And uh, basically after that, I joined ThoughtWorks and we were trying to work on this big program of work uh, using agile methods and I had this interesting challenge of making the whole database work with the agile methods and how do you do database design in an evolutionary way, how do you refactor existing data, migrate data and how do you put databases in continuous integration cycles and things like that. I had Martin and Ward Cunningham uh, coaching us and that was really a really great experience and from that experience we came out with a bunch of practices that helped uh, people do evolutionary database design. And later on in 2004 or 2005, I co-wrote a book with uh, Scott Ambler uh, titled Refactoring Databases, Evolutionary Database Design. Later on, I also wrote a, like an e-book to uh, tell the story of how you can put databases in your continuous integration cycle how you can publish artifacts to deploy databases in an automated way and things like that. And later on, working for, for a couple of clients, uh, getting involved in this whole NoSQL space, we put a system in production using MongoDB, like early 2009, and then used that experience to do more deployments of systems using other databases like uh, React, uh, Neo4j, uh, and things like that. So, that's where I and Martin got together and thought, like, why not give a good introduction to NoSQL, uh, what it means, how it changes your design thinking, so that people can get a single book that will give them the breadth of NoSQL choices available, and not just that, but also show them what are the pitfalls of uh, going to this and what to watch out for and how to use multiple databases in their application. In this book, we wanted to talk about NoSQL databases from a different perspective, like not just take a database and show what are its uh, features, but more from like how you change your design thinking around using NoSQL databases, like from aggregated oriented versus non-aggregate oriented, uh, like basically how you apply the domain-driven design concepts uh, when using NoSQL and why NoSQL makes it easier to apply those concepts. So the, the original idea for NoSQL Distilled really came from a conversation I was having over lunch one time with my acquisition editor here at Pearson, whose name is Greg Dench. And we were tossing around various ideas about books we'd seen and books that had succeeded. And Greg talked a little bit about how successful UML Distilled had been. And it was that point it really occurred to us that perhaps there was room for a similar kind of treatment in the area of NoSQL databases. The thing with NoSQL databases is that it's an area that's got a lot of interest at the moment. There's a lot of people talking about it. 
but there isn't really a lot of good information for you to find out exactly what they are and what makes them interesting. I mean, there are lots of blog posts out there and you can trawl around the web for weeks, but to really get good quality information is hard and it takes a lot of time. So this is really the perfect opportunity for something like a NoSQL distilled. In the later on, we talk about schema migration, uh, especially because people get tripped up uh, NoSQL databases being schemaless, and I don't have to think about schema migrations. That's not true. You have to think about schema migrations because schema is implicit in your application code. And once you change application code, you may not be able to get to certain data because the schema in the application is now different than what the database stores it as. The whole idea with a distilled treatment is how do we go out, sort through all of that information that's out there, and compress it down into 150 pages or so of good compact information that will be handy. Something that you can read quite easily over the course of a few hours, but give you an overview of what's going on. And that's really the target of the book. It's to get you started to understand the breadth of the, the NoSQL space and to think about whether it's something that you should use either in an upcoming project or as part of an existing system that you're working on. We expect the audience to mostly be people of what I would call tech leads, um, people who have a relatively senior technology role, typically leading a team, could be a small team, could be a large team. Um, these people often go under the term architect, which is a more controversial term. But certainly, if you're a software architect, this is the kind of book that would also um, be appropriate for you. Well, the key thing really about this book is the fact that it's broad. It covers the whole of the NoSQL spectrum. It's brief. Um, we didn't actually manage to keep it to 150 pages. It's looking like it's going to be 170 pages, but we hope you'll forgive us for that. And also that it's founded very much on general principles. Um, although the, what's in the book is based on our experiences and our colleagues' experiences working with actual NoSQL databases, what we try to cover in the book as much as possible is general principles that you need to know whether these things are going to be useful to you without getting into the details of our particular system's work. The aim is that this book provides information that's going to be of lasting value. It's not going to no longer be relevant in three or four years as the technology changes. Well, if I had to talk about three key takeaways from the book, the first, without a doubt, is the notion of polyglot persistence, um, which is a rather tongue-twisting term. But basically what it says is that so far, in the last 20 years or so, what we've seen is when you choose your data storage mechanism, the question, if you even have a question at all, is which relational database do I use? And for many people, it's, of course, not even that, to use whatever your company's standard relational database happens to be. What the NoSQL movement has really wrought most significantly is the fact that now we're beginning to ask the question, what is the appropriate data storage technology for my particular problem? And more than that, it's a case of I may be working on a problem with different kinds of data storage characteristics, and I may want to use different data storage technologies for different parts of the problem. And that's really the thing about polyglot persistence we now have to start thinking about what is the right data storage and then choosing appropriate products that fit those needs. The second point applies to many but not all of the NoSQL databases and it's something that we refer to in the book as aggregate orientation. Now, as I said, it doesn't apply to all of them. In particular, graph databases don't have this characteristic. But those that do have this idea of taking some complex structure of data in kind of a think of a nested hierarchic structure and talking to the database in terms of those structures so that instead of um, building up a complex bit of data in your um, in memory and then having to do a bunch of SQL calls to scatter that data over multiple tables in a relational database what you do instead is take that big complex lump of data and transfer it as a single lump or aggregate to that database. 
This aggregate may be the value of a key value store, it's the document of a document database, it's a column family in a column family style store. But the notion is that we communicate in the database in terms of these aggregates. The term aggregate comes from domain driven design and in fact it's a technique that's often used with relational databases to help um, better organize how you talk to that database. If you think in terms of aggregates it's often easier to communicate back and forth with a database. But the thing is that the database, once it's received the data, doesn't know anything about aggregates. And the disadvantage about that is then the database can't use that information to figure out how to store the data effectively. And this is particularly important if you're going to run over a cluster. When you're talking about trying to distribute data across many machines, it's very handy to know which bits of data tend to be accessed together. And so the aggregate becomes a very useful use of storage, a kind of unit of storage for that. Now, aggregate orientation is, is often very useful, but it isn't always a good thing. It very much depends on the fact that you have this single structure that you can communicate back and forth to the database. And this is often the case. Um, a great example of this is the Guardian newspaper, whose natural aggregate is an article. It tends to talk to the database in terms of articles. Therefore, you go back and forth in terms of articles. Um, another system that uh, I visited recently was to do with purchase orders, and the purchase order became the natural aggregate. But some systems don't have this. In some systems, you want to slice and dice your data in different ways. And in that situation, it's actually better to have a relational database or a graph database that is ignorant of aggregates. So the third thing I would mention as a highlight is the attitude towards consistency that's taken by NoSQL databases. And like with the aggregate thing, there's a bit of a caveat straight off. Um, this is only a characteristic of those databases that are aggregate oriented. The graph databases use the same approach to consistency and acid transactions that a relational database does. The thing that's different about aggregate oriented databases is because they speak in terms of aggregates, that's also their natural unit of consistency. So as a result, when you want to make an atomic update to a database, it's in terms of a single aggregate. You can't make atomic updates that cross the aggregate boundaries. Now, this isn't as much of a disadvantage as you might immediately think, because the aggregate is, of course, quite a rich structure. So you can actually do the equivalent of what would be many different table updates in a relational database with a single aggregate-oriented update. Another factor that comes in terms of consistency is how to deal with consistency and distribution. As soon as you start distributing data across multiple nodes, potentially allowing multiple nodes to handle updates, then you've got a whole bunch of new consistency problems to deal with. This often comes up under the term the CAP theorem, which is stated in the form of you've got three things, consistency, availability, partition tolerance, and you can only have two of the three. As we say in the book, that's not really, I think, the easiest way to think about it. And the way to think about it that I find easiest to think about is to say, well, if I've got a distributed system, then that distributed system may partition into different parts of the system that can't properly communicate. These partitions are big, basically because of the network's breakdown. Now, when we get a partition, we then must either maintain consistency but lose a lot of the availability of the system because it can't talk to each itself properly, or we say we're going to keep the system up and going but then we're going to introduce inconsistencies. And that choice, which is actually not a binary choice, it's a spectrum of levels of consistency and, and availability that we can have, that's really the essence of what the CAP theorem is talking about. And indeed it goes beyond availability. In fact, my argument that I really focus on is to say what's really happening is a trade-off between consistency and latency. Whenever you've got a distributed system, if you want maximum consistency, you've got to talk to all the nodes. But if you talk to all the nodes, it's going to take a long time for the distributed system to reply to you, thus increasing latency. If you want the, fat, the lowest possible latency, you want to talk to just one node. But then it can't talk to the other ones, so you have a problem with consistency. So what's actually happening is a trade-off between consistency and latency. And lack of availability is just what happens when the latency goes beyond your timeout point.